Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another English 370 lecture. We are once again talking about sociolinguistics today. I don't have too much to intro with here, I guess. I hope you've been enjoying your beautiful weekend. I'm recording this on Sunday, and it is sunny and warm. Pretty great. Um, so last time we started talking about sociolinguistics on Wednesdays, um, recording, and we looked at a few key things. First, we looked at um, this notion of variation, and that linguistic variants exist even within a single language. So within English, people don't speak the same, right? It's, it's sort of an obvious fact, but it's one that we need to reiterate um, from our more linguistic, scientific perspective. And what's more, more than just this variation, we looked at things like... Um, how this variation correlates with different social differences. The different social groups, social demographics are using language differently. And that this affects our perceptions. Then when we hear these different variants, like somebody saying the car needs washed, or somebody saying about or a, these Canadian indexes, not the car needing washed, but the other two, we think of them as Canadian even if they might not be. We have no, you know, even if we don't know whether they are or not, we hear those linguistic features and we immediately think of Canadianness. And this is, illustrates an important point, which is language's ability to index certain social properties. So we would say that the linguistic variable in this uh, hypothetical situation, in which somebody uses a, Ryan got in a, that the use of that variable indexes or points to that person as being Canadian. And again, this is um, separate from the actual facts of whether they are Canadian or not. It nonetheless indexes them in people's perceptions as being Canadian. And this, this process of a, so of a linguistic variant pointing to or indexing certain social properties, we're going to call indexicality indexicality. And we're going to see the use of indexicality and extend our notion of indexicality probably on Wednesday's lecture. We probably won't make it to that today, but those were important things that we discussed in Wednesday's lecture. That's your quick recap. The other thing we talked about, which we're going to follow up more directly on today, is this idea of there are three waves of sociolinguistics, which are sort of these historical eras of sociolinguistic research starting from about the 1960s to present. And we'll see how the methodology and um, imagining the perspective on this indexicality notion has evolved over time. So we began looking at the first wave of sociolinguistics, looking at a very famous study by Bill Labov. This is called the fourth floor study, and it exemplifies that first wave. And things you need to remember that should click about the first wave are this. It associates big, broad stroke social categories with linguistic variants. So it's interested in the linguistic variants within groups like uh, with along lines of race and ethnicity, socioeconomic class, gender, um, things like that. Big, big categories, often on a national scale. The, uh, so that's one, big groups. And the other thing was that um, there, people don't have much agency in these studies often in choosing their linguistic variables or choosing the way that their language indexes them. Um, you have a way that you are raised speaking. This is your vernacular, the way that you speak when nobody's around you or perhaps when you're at home. And that that is the way that it is, unchanging. You can, you know fancy it up for things like interviews and whatnot, but at, at your core, that's the way you speak, which leaves, again, the speaker a little option to choose how they want to speak and how, you know, being able to choose how you speak, as we're going to see today, influences very much how people see you. We've already established this connection between language and identity, language and demographics. So being able to select the linguistic variant that you choose allows people to select how they want to be seen. Let that sink in a little bit. That's going to be a really important point for today, right? Once we have this connection between the linguistic variable 
and the perceptions of somebody who speaks that variable, the variable being this A and the perception being they're Canadian, I can then, or anybody can then, choose which linguistic variable they want to use and thus alter the way people see them. If I want to pretend that I'm Canadian because I, so, I associate Canadian-ness with being friendly, etc., all some, some good things, hopefully, I can choose to use those variables to associate myself with Canada, with that category. We're jumping the gun a little bit. Let's slow things down and jump back into the second wave. If what I was just talking about doesn't quite make sense yet, we're going to get there. So we had the first wave, which is big strokes and little agency. Now we're going to move on to the second wave. And the second wave changes both of those along both of those dimensions. In one dimension, it goes instead of these big categories like race and gender and socioeconomic class, it focuses on more local groups. So there are studies that were look at local community centers or high schools or geographic regions, smaller geographic regions, more local. That's one thing. They're going to look at more local groups. And with regards, oh, I'm on the wrong screen. Give me a moment. There we go. With regards to agency, it's also going to ratchet up the level of agency, the degree of agency that speakers have. And it's going to allow speakers, like I was just talking about, to choose how to associate themselves, choose which linguistic variant they use, thereby declaring themselves sort of on one side or another. If that helps you think about it that way. Right, so think about uh, um, a high school is not a bad, there's been studies, Penny Ecker herself has done studies looking at jocks versus burnouts. Jocks versus burnouts, so jocks being the athletic, um, the athletic group in a school and burnouts being um, anti-establishment types, often more prone to drug use in Penny Eckert's work in Detroit high schools. And so we can see in this scenario that it's, these are more locally defined based on the high school that you're in and that people can choose which group they associate by speaking like one group or another. In some work, performing or speaking like a jock is a crucial aspect of actually being a jock. It's not just being in athletics. You also have to have all the cultural other stuff that goes on in language as part of that very uh, eloquently said cultural other stuff. So you get to choose, choose your group. We're gonna look at a study um, that sort of exemplifies the second wave uh, methodology, second wave perspective. It's uh, gonna be another study by Bill Laboff, actually. We're, we're sticking to our Bill Laboff material for today. And um, this was a study done in the early 60s uh, on an island called Martha's Vineyard. This is an island off the coast of Massachusetts on the eastern coast of the United States. And it's a fairly small place, right? So this is, it only had at the time a year-round population of about 6,000. I have to imagine that's increased dramatically since, but at that time that was the case. And the one interesting aspect of this study is that it notes that the island itself is split into two regions. There's an eastern region, which is more touristy, right? This is a sort of idyllic island, so it attracts a lot of tourists. And the western region, which is the OG islanders, right? This is where um, the people who have been on the island for a long time tend to be the original islanders. It's a fishing community primarily, so they tend to be fishermen. Just to give you an idea of where we're looking at, this is Massachusetts or the eastern coast of the United States here. And you can see Martha's Vineyard is this island. It's a fairly large island, um, but not too populous. So the actual linguistic study, let's talk about that. What did Bill Above want to do? Well, he wanted to look at a certain linguistic variable, which were centralized diphthongs. We're dipping back into our phonetics and phonology for today's class. And he saw that Martha's Vineyard had a peculiar pronunciation of certain diphthongs in which they were centralized. Centralized, you can imagine here, I'll bring up, right, take a look at um, this vowel chart. 
So we have edges here and we have a center. So the diphthongs were pronounced in a more centralized way. A and ow instead of I and ow. Um, that was a terrible pronunciation of it. But that's fine. Um, so he wanted to see who was using these centralized diphthongs. These centralized diphthongs. As opposed to the lowered mainland pronunciations. Right? This is about where you begin your diphthong. That's what these are showing. And what he found was that the, this linguistic variable, because the island had both, it had the mainland pronunciation, some people used that, and some people used this kind of uh, different islander centralized view, but determined which one, which variant, which linguistic variable you use was largely your attitude towards the islander life, towards Martha's Vineyard itself. It depended on your positive or negative orientation, right? It had to do with people's association with the island and the island culture. So here's a quote, right? People come down here to Martha's Vineyard and they don't understand the backgrounds, right? That this was a maritime tradition. And it's the separation between the island and the mainland. And so pro-islanders, Labov found by and large, were using centralized diphthongs. This was common amongst fishermen and locals. We're using the centralized ones. Whereas people with a negative attitude towards the island were using the mainland lowered version of the diphthongs. So that this, um, this linguistic variant centralized or lower diphthongs became associated, becomes associated with pro-islander status or anti-islander status. Right? Pro-islander status would be people that are very proud of their cultural heritage and being part of the original members of people who have lived on the island for generations, where people with a negative attitude would be people that would want off the island. Oh, soon, as soon as I graduate, as soon as I I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get out of here. I'm going to go to the mainland. I'm done with this place. That's a negative islander attitude. And so this study looked at that link then between identity and language. Right? This is in juxtaposition or opposition even to the type of study we looked at last Wednesday with the fourth floor, where what determined your linguistic variant in those cases your situation growing up, right? Remember that idea of the vernacular. Depending on what household, what scenario you grew up in, you would speak one way or the other. This is not, in the Martha's Vineyard case, the use of this diphthong, centralized diphthong or not, is not linked to where you were born or raised. These people that Labov is interviewing to get this data from, they're all locals to the island. They were all born and raised on the island. And thus, that cannot be the determining factor on which style you use. Instead, the determining factor seems to be your attitude, your affiliation, your cultural identity. And if your cultural identity is rooted in the island, you'll use the centralized diphthongs, which are particular to the island. They, they index you as being an islander. And if you're an anti-islander person, instead you use the mainland vowel, the mainland diphthong. And Labov sums this up. There's a, there's a quote when a man says, right, our house, he's unconsciously establishing the fact that he belongs to the island. When you use this variant, you're establishing that you belong to the island, that you're one of the natives to whom the island really belongs. So I hope what you that the take home point for this is a again the local this is a more local environment you couldn't do this kind of study on a national scale it just doesn't make sense this is a variable that only makes sense on the island so it's localized and the other thing is that it increases the agency these speakers get to choose which variable they use and the selection of the variable that they use in turn has an effect on their identity it's a piece of their identity. Sweet. We did it. That's second wave. Second wave linguistics. Normally I would take questions here, but obviously I cannot.
or mess in the lag. If you have questions at this point, write them down and ask me later. Either send me an email or we'll talk about them in Friday's synchronous class. But for the rest of us, I'm going to get a drink of water and carry on talking about sociolinguistics, something I love to do. I'm going to talk about third wave sociolinguistics next. So again, we have this bi-dimensional space where there's the size of the group that is being looked at and there's the amount of agency that they have. In the third wave, just pushes harder in the direction that the second wave was already looking. So where the second wave started to look at more local environments, the third wave of sociolinguistics is gonna look even more local yet, even smaller, to the point where it often focuses on individuals, and individ individuals' language use and construction of identity. Even smaller in terms of the set that we're looking at. So smaller, and in addition, it pushes harder in the agency direction. Where in the second wave, people got the agency to choose which linguistic variable they were going to select and thus which, um, what they were going to identify themselves with. In that scenario that we just saw in second wave sociolinguistics, they were choosing between two pre-established groups. You can either choose pro-islander status or anti-islander status. Option A or option B. Those were the choices that people had, which is agency. But in the third wave of sociolinguistics, they ratchet up once again the amount of agency people have, and instead of choosing from predetermined groups, we focus instead on how people actually use language itself to create the groups. They don't choose a group, they're actually creating the groups from language. It begins to look at how people pick and choose linguistic variables for their own life on an individual basis in order to construct, to cobble together an identity for themselves. So they don't have to buy in and just use all the language that jocks do to index themselves as a jocks, or alternatively, buy in and use all the language variants that burnouts do to index themselves as a burnout. Aha, instead, they can take a little bit from here to make themselves seem athletic, and they can take a little bit from here to make themselves seem anti-establishment, and thus they can create for themselves a category of identity which perhaps combines things, athletic and anti-establishment, boom, and marries those things by selecting bricolage, by bringing together linguistic variants to create for themselves. And that's a much higher degree of agency than we've seen up to this point. Let's take a look at a study. Uh, that will help us out a little bit here. So this is a study done in Bolton, the United Kingdom, ethnographic work, and it's looking at uh, a group of people. It's following a particular group of students who were popular girls, right? You can imagine this in a high school setting. They were the popular girls. And it follows them in this ethnographic work over a period of time of at least a year. And it follows the cultural identity shift in a few of these teenage girls as they begin to experiment not with a popular girl lifestyle but instead start to embrace some of these aspects of a wild or a towny lifestyle right. and it sees that this shift in cultural identity is accompanied by or perhaps even accomplished by using certain linguistic indicators, right? Non-standardisms being chief amongst those, things like I were drunk instead of I was drunk. So this use of first and third person were in these girls was increased from 25 to 48 percent. What does that even mean? Well, it's 25, 25 uh, percent uh, would be 25 of the percent of the time that you use first or third person was, you instead use were. So it's out of the possible 
times you could have used that you used it either 25 to 40 percent of the time right and so what we're seeing here is that this third wave of sociolinguistics is seeing linguistic variables as resources that people can use to define themselves and construct for themselves identities now it's not seeing linguistic this doesn't put um language in a privileged position it sees language and language choice of variables as one amongst a number of cultural resources that people can use so that it's not just choosing baggy ripped jeans that determines which social group you are but it's also the way that you speak and that both these things a material clothing fashion and the linguistic fashion, if you want to see it that way, are contributing to this construction of an identity that people are actively creating for themselves. Not just selecting groups, but actively creating. And that you can change, you can change. These are not permanent things, as we saw in this study of UK girls in uh, Bolton, but that they shift over time as you continue to redefine who you are, you can continue to redefine the way that you speak. And this can either be intentional or unintentional. It's that's the the intentionality is a fascinating question. Um, and one that's not incredibly clear. Sometimes it is you often get people explicitly saying, Yeah, I, I used this linguistic indicator to, you know, because it sounds more like the group I want to associate with. So sometimes you do get explicit meta narratives like that, which talk about how people use language to associate themselves with certain identities, but not always. Sometimes it does seem a little less conscious. A couple other things um, to note about this, which are interesting, is it shifts how we view people's identities in itself. It's got this kind of um, constructionist approach, right? Where language identity isn't anymore something that you have. It's not a static category that you possess. I don't just have the, the identity of a professor. No, instead, I'm actually actively, I'm performing that identity. Right? I'm performing that identity by recording lectures on YouTube. But I'm also performing that identity by the way that I speak in hopefully somewhat of a, a, an articulate manner. I, I at least try sometimes. Recording videos is difficult, so I don't manage. But it's that I'm, it's not a static category that I possess. Instead, it's a performance that I'm constantly performing my identity. And if I shift these performances to use a different style of language, that will then have consequences on my identity itself, because my identity is growing out of these performances. It's a different way of looking at identity than you may be used to. Um, but it's a really interesting one. And third wave linguistics is really well equipped to look at these types of cultural constructions of identity. If you're interested in that aspect or anything else in sociolinguistics, I would encourage you as well, if you haven't, to take the class English 372 at Calvin um, that I'm teaching. It's on sociolinguistics and we look a lot more at these questions of performance of identity and cultural constructions and things like that. I'm going to talk more about it today and on Wednesday's class too. So. You're not out of the woods if you're not interested in this, but if you are, there's there's a place where you can learn more. Whew. Okay, so that wraps up what I wanted to talk about in regards to these waves, right? That wraps up the second and the third wave. I'm gonna shift gears now, and we're gonna start talking more about AAE or AAVE, African American English. And we're gonna use this as a case study. We're going to use it as a case study to see how these perceptions, these indexes, form around languages, and furthermore, the consequences that these perceptions have on people. Right, so now we've uh, done a lot of linguistics, <laughs> if you want to think of our uh, 
our adventure through sociolinguistics this way. We've done a lot of linguistics and looked at these methodologies, ways of studying them, ways of having these perceptions, and now we're going to spend more time looking at the social ramifications of the linguistics that we've just seen. Why does this matter is the question I want you to be asking yourself at this very moment. I always want you to question, why does this matter? Why should I care? And now in this next bit, I'm going to tell you why you should care. As a spoiler alert, why you should care is because it affects human life. And I want you to care about human life. That's why you should care. This affects real people in real ways. And that's what we're going to get at now. We're going to get at that kind of these issues by looking at and um, talking about African American English, AAE, over the next, so the second half of this lecture and also in class on Wednesday. I'm going to call for the record this, this variant many different things. So this is, this is a distinct language variety, a dialect, if you want to use those terms, that's different from this idealized standard Midwest American English. And while there is significant mutual intelligibility, these things are both variants of English, there are big differences between these variants. There's big differences between these varieties. I'm going to use several terms, what I was going to say, to go back to my point from a second ago. There are several terms I'm going to use for these. I'll, you'll, you'll hear me say um, AAE, African American English, or AAVE, African American Vernacular English. You'll also hear me term, use the terms Black English. These are all getting at the same idea. None of these are offensive. They're all just, or certainly not intended to be offensive. I can get to decide that, it turns out. But I, I sincerely hope none of these are in, uh, offensive. They're all academic terms that are, are using for this. And uh, I wanted to clarify that because I'll use several different terms. And in that regard, we also want to be cognizant and recognize the fact that there's no such thing as just a, as an African American, like one monolithic entity, which is African American English or African American vernacular English. That's not just a thing that's out there. It's not a monolithic whole, but rather there are many, many, many different ways of speaking AAVE, and they may share certain core um, grammatical features or variant choices, but that there are very different versions of AAV itself, just like there are many versions of other dialects of English. And these things can vary based on your region very critically, where you're at. African American vernacular English is not spoken the same in Detroit as it is in Atlanta. There are similarities there, maybe enough to draw a common line, but it's not identical. This isn't the monolithic entity. And your group, your age, all of these things affect how one might speak AAVE. Why do we talk about these things? Well, it's a really good case study, like I mentioned, for seeing the social ramifications of language use and language prejudice. And part of that reason is that this gets talked about so much in the media. And you see this present it's uh, hopefully relevant to your own lives. Black English lexical items are often absorbed into standard English as youth slang, these youthy or hip words. Uh, these ones are from a few years ago. Obviously, I'll, I'll be dating myself here. But when you see these trendy or youthy words, um, they often have their origin in the African-American community. Right. A few years ago, these were words like on, on fleek, lit, fire, quiet for, uh, a bunch of things. And this is constantly changing because, you know, things can't be hip for too long before they become unhip and something else comes along to replace it. And despite the fact that African-American vernacular English is just a dialect of English like many others that we've already seen. And it shows the exact same amount, degree of variation within itself and opposed to other dialects as other varieties. Despite all of that, African-American English is particularly stigmatized. 
hopefully I don't have to tell you this. Hopefully this is something you're already aware of, but right. So when we compare the prejudice that people, the per perceptions or perspectives that people have on African-American English, and we compare them to things like the dialect of Boston with the R drawn, right? Parking the car in Harvard Yard, whatever. Or my dialect that can say something like the car needs washed or the northern city's vowel shifts. All of these different dialects are showing variation. And yet, for some reason, African-American vernacular English, African-American ways of speaking are particularly stigmatized. Very negatively. Think about for a minute, hopefully it doesn't even take you that long, why that might be. Why are African-American varieties particularly stigmatized? Think about why we care about this. African-American language is particularly stigmatized because at the end of the day, that prejudice is not about language. It's about racism. Language and African-American language is used as a proxy for racism in the United States. African-American language is denigrated and prejudiced because we've said that it's okay to denigrate somebody's language when really what's underlying that is a racist tendency against African-American populations in the United States. We're, we're, we're pulling no punches in today's class. That's what this is about, right? That's why, despite this shared dialectal variation, that it falls just into line with these other things, it's brought out of line and singled out as being particularly problematic in the United States. <laughs> it's not. Do not fall prey to the to the falsehood, to the idea that this is something particular about African-American English, that African-American English is particularly deficient in X, Y, or Z way. That is nonsense. It's nonsense. <laughs> and that this prejudice, I wanted to say too, a quick point is that that doesn't mean that these other dialects like Boston dialect or like Appalachian dialect, Southern dialects, that there aren't prejudiced against them. They have certain prejudices as well, but the degree of prejudice against these other dialects doesn't match anywhere near to the degree of prejudice that has been leveraged against African-American communities and African-American vernacular English speakers. A lot of this comes from this core idea, this misconception, this, this lie that we've been told that we've been indoctrinated with, for many of us, not all, but many of us, that African-American vernacular English is somehow wrong or bad, that it's an incorrect way of speaking. There is an idea that this is broken English that only exists because people don't learn English correctly. I wish I could use stronger language to describe how ridiculous that concept is. How poisonous that indoctrination of this idea is. How insidious this lie that you've been told. This isn't people who haven't learned English correctly. It's a different dialect. And it's just as put on, remember our differences here between descriptive linguistics and prescriptive linguistics. It's just as accurate, as functional, as well suited to the purpose of communication as any language that you could ever speak. It's not this collection of errors that we've been um, mistakenly told. It's just not true, right? And we can see this when we, when we use our descriptive tools that hopefully you, class, have been equipped with thus far. We can see this for what it really is. Right? And we can do this by seeing that African-American vernacular English, it's not just wrong or bad, it's just different. It's just different. And there are rules that govern it. It's not random, it's not 
mistakes. It's governed by a system of rules. Think about our syntax lectures, right? Just like any other language for ideas. We'll go over a few of these, right? So there are some sort of flagstone things that are stereotypes that are often held up about African American vernacular English, like the proximate future marker finna. So instead of uh, in African American vernacular English, this one finna fall. In standard English, it would be something more like this one is about to fall. It communicates the same thing there. Right? It's just a different way of saying it. This doesn't make it wrong, right? They're done is another class one, classic one. They done used them by now, for they have used them by now. Another one that gets misconstrued a lot is this habitual non-finite be. So if you say something like in African American English, I'm not a speaker of this. I don't mean to portray myself as a speaker of this. I'm a linguist who has um, looked enough and read enough studies um, to convey this information to you, but it's not firsthand. Also to be very straightforward and clear, I'm telling you information that other people, other more knowledgeable people than myself have um, talked about and discussed with native speakers. So in African American English, something like they play in games uh, means in standard English, if you were to translate that, so to speak, it would be something like they are playing games episodically, right? As opposed to they be playing games, which is something more like they're often playing games. And you often see this um, habitual non-finite be showing up with um, adverbs. They always be playing games. It's not an instance, an episode, but rather a habit of theirs, something that happens often or recurs. And that these things, when speakers don't know the differences between these two utterances, they often assume that they're used interchangeably, that this is where that sort of uh, random collection of errors comes from. This can't be systematic. Look, they say they play in games sometimes. And, Speakers say they'd be playing games other times, and that's just different. They're just dropping the B. It's just left out in that first example. That's, that's not the case. These things have two distinct meanings that follow different rule patterns. We're not going to go over all of these. Uh, feel free to look at them. It's just a, a list of features that often appear, not necessarily in African American English, and how their rule govern. There's some instant, some, some kind of interesting ones. Um, that's, we had been looking at grammatical features. Here are some um, phonological features where you get reduction in metathesis. So instead of, you know, guest with that hard T, turns into guess. Uh, ask metathesizes. It's a historical linguistic process in which letters switch around. They sort of flip, so from ask to ax. Monothongization of these diphthongs and non graticity in these things in words like four o'clock, you would drop that R. And what's what can be interesting about these process, prof, processes is that oftentimes, sometimes at least, the African American vernacular English form more clearly. Um, is descended from an old English form, from an older form, right? So forms like this, like ax, which is often seen as um, uh, deficient, it's often seen as problematic, right? Ax, like somebody misspoke, actually comes from old English, what it used to be in English? Axian, axian, ax from axian, right? So that we can see if we go back to this as the source, it's actually standard English that has done the metathesis, the flipping to ask, and the African-American English has actually resisted that metathesis and has sort of a more faithful representation of the old English form than standard English itself does. Right? It's again, it's a part of that perspective and that perception that views African-American ways of speaking as incorrect, regardless of the systematicity the rigor, the rules, or the historical trajectory. Not that historical trajectory should be used to prove either point, really, like who cares, but it is kind of interesting nonetheless for us as linguists. And the same thing you can see in, in stress shift, where African-American English police um, with this word initial stress also actually mirrors initial uh, older stress patterns from Old English. Okay, 
So we've covered now, I'm, we're, we're starting to dispel, hopefully, this myth, this pervasive myth of African-American English as bad or incorrect or just poorly learned English. So we see that they're playing on the same, it should be, linguistically speaking, they're on the same footing, but that perceptionally and um, stereotypically and from a prejudice standpoint, they're very much so not. So we're going to look now at perceptions of these linguistic differences. One interesting thing that we'll start with is that perspectives and perceptions on African American English vary wildly depending on who you ask. That's not terribly surprising, but they did some cool studies where they asked African American speakers, um, how do you perceive this language when they had an African American speaker um, using a copula or not? That's the to be. Copula means to be. And that when African American speakers heard another African American speaker use a copula, they associated it with higher education and job satisfaction and um, so they did this for a bunch of groups. African-American speakers viewed it this way. African-Americans who didn't identify as speaking AAE nonetheless identified AAE speakers using copula with greater reliability and politeness. There seemed to be some sort of cultural awareness there where on non-African-Americans, they perceived the African-American speaker using copula or not no differently. So our perceptions of linguistic variance is itself shaped by our cultural experience and our cultural associations. Cool, cool point, right? And we can think interestingly, we're not going to talk about this a ton right now, but I do want you to, as a class to think about what this means, what this means for our um, conception of lingui language or linguistic discrimination. What does this mean? This differentiation of perceptions based on our prior experiences. So that's an interesting question for you. So we had already talked about how grammatical properties, the use of these linguistic properties, contribute to sounding black. They contribute to um, speaking African American English. And this feeds racially driven prejudices. Again, remembering that this, it, it's not about, at the end of the day, the language and the language prejudice. It's about people prejudice, racism. So we're going to look at some hard and fast um, consequences of this kind of prejudice. So education will be the first place that we look with um, black and white Achievement gaps in education, these, these have been talked about for a long time. Achievement gaps between um, white students and black students. And what researchers have found is that this gap in how well students are performing educationally cannot be entirely attributed to income, wealth. And it can't be attributed to things like parental education level as well. Not that they don't play a role, but they're not enough to account for the size of the gap in achievement. And what they found instead is that language is extremely important, that the language of the student, be they black or white, plays a, a large role in their success. And that what we're seeing in this black and white education gap is actually a reflection of linguistic um, competency and that white speakers speaking something of a more standard dialect are more catered to, more privileged, and they start from a different place than African-American speakers who speak an equally valid, equally difficult, equally functionally equivalent dialect, African-American vernacular English. This led to um, a bunch of different proposals when people started tuning into thinking, aha, a language is key to this achievement gap, the logical conclusion there was, let's do something about the about speakers' language and the way that they're treated in the classroom unfairly based on their language to address this. Yeah. How do you think, um, how do you think, class, that 
that, that people responded to this notion, right? So this, this led to, uh, it says controversy right on it, so you probably guessed, the Oakland Ebonics controversy. The Oakland Ebonics controversy is this. I'll, I'll, I realize I'm running out of time, so I'm going to try and be quick, but it's this. The Oakland School Board in California, seeing this education gap between its students and knowing that language was at play here, came up with a, a plan of action in which they would address the linguistic equality in the, fo in the following ways. They would use African-American English in the classrooms to help African-American English speaking students get up to speed, right? This in a lot of ways was driven by foreign language research, which showed that if you want somebody to speak English, if you want Spanish speakers to speak to speak English. Just jabbering at them in English is not the best approach, but rather speaking to them in their home language, in Spanish, in this example, teaching them English via Spanish instruction actually gets much more um, success. This is kind of a bridge method of instruction. You use their Spanish literacy skills to achieve English literacy. And so the same idea was applied to African-American vernacular English. They were saying, let's use, let's talk to these students in the language that they already speak so that we can tell them the differences between African-American English and standard English, standard English, and they'll gain a better mastery in standard English. Of course, they'll maintain their mastery of African-American English. Why wouldn't they? But they'll gain increased mastery <coughs> in standard English, just like the Spanish speaker would. It's a fantastic idea rooted in um, a lot of good research. How did America respond to this proposal class? They lost their mind. Right. They lost their minds. There was huge pushback against this proposal. And it stemmed once again from prejudice and misunderstanding. Prejudice was the racially driven prejudice that we've already been talking about. The misunderstanding is, although what the school board was saying is that we're going to use African-American English to teach these students better standard English, what uh, America heard was, we're going to teach your children African-American English. Why they heard that is anybody's guess, but that's what they heard. That was never part of the plan, right? These students that they were talking about and addressing already spoke African-American English. Nobody needed to teach anybody that variety. But nonetheless, panic ensued, and this was actually shut down. And it hasn't been the same sorts of teaching methodologies, which were well-founded, haven't found their way back into the education system until fairly recently, 20 years later. A tragedy, really, a tragedy that affects people. Not, a, not an idle tragedy, but one that affects people's quality of life and well-being and possibly survival, right? A tragedy occurred. It's interesting. I could talk at length about... <laughs> the Ebonics controversy, perhaps I'll share some videos that go into more depth, but what went on in that time is astounding um, and speaks a lot to these issues of um, racially driven linguistic prejudice. Um, but that's, that's, that's the background on language. We'll keep going. Just a few more points before I wrap up here. Some other factors, again, that show the consequences of the type of linguistic prejudice that we see in the United States and beyond are things like this, right? That simply sounding black, sounding black, speaking African-American English, that costs you on average 10% of your wages, no questions asked. No differences in performance, all other things being equal, 10% wage reduction for sounding black, based on nothing, based on nothing but this, linguistic. Be angry. If you're, if you're wondering, Professor Ross, what's my appropriate re what's an appropriate reaction to these statistics that I'm showing you? I'll tell you the appropriate 
emotion to feel, the appropriate reaction here is anger. Now we want to channel that anger, obviously, into something more productive, but this is injustice. This is injustice that we're talking about, right? An injustice from a linguistic standpoint, but it doesn't remain a linguistic standpoint, right? This linguistic prejudice seeps into people's actual lives. There's also been studies that have looked at um, housing opportunities and things like that, right? There's a kind of semi-famous study that was done in the Bay Area where um, a, a researcher who had full command of both African-American English and a more standard variety, right? He could code switch between these two varieties, did an experiment where he would call different housing agencies and ask about the availability of apartments or housing. And he would do this twice. He would call and ask about it using African-American vernacular English, and he would call and ask about it using standard white English. And what he found was that he was 50% less likely to be shown an apartment, to be told an apartment was available when he spoke African-American vernacular English. They would actually tell him that the apartment was taken when he would call and ask about it in African-American English, and then he would call right back under a different name using standard, a more standard variety of English, and they would tell him the apartment was available and set up a time for him to see it. Again, the injustice of this should be something that I hope sticks with you, that I hope keeps you up a little bit at night tonight. That's what I that's what I hope. That's what I hope. We're gonna we're gonna cut it here because I'm already after my time. But I wanna leave you again with that feeling of injustice at what is transpiring. And this isn't news, right? The fact that racism exists in the United States, I'm not I'm not blowing anybody's mind with that. But I do hope to give you a different perspective on it that you might not have had before, which is the the linguistic contributions to this racist, this racist jugger, cultural juggernaut that we have in the United States. That's what I that's what I hope this has shown you. So we've done several things. We looked at the second and third wave of sociolinguistics in this class, and we saw how the increase in agency lining up with this decrease in size, that we're focusing on smaller groups and we're increasing their agency, their ability to choose their own linguistic variables and through that to choose their own identity. That was part one of today's lecture. In part two, we really dove down into a case study of African-American English and looked at both some perceptions of African-American English and the reality of African-American English and saw that they don't line up. That they don't line up. Then we extended and saw how these perceptions, these misguided perceptions of African American vernacular English translate into injustice in things like um, wage reduction and housing opportunities and things like educational opportunities that matter to people's lives and well-being. And that's where we should be mad, class. That's it's that's where we should be upset with the system and work towards changing it. How we do that, we're going to look at a little bit next time, and we're going to we're going to go deeper into this um, issue of uh, linguistic prejudice in the United States. Again, um, keeping with our case study of African American vernacular English for Wednesday's lecture, we're going to see a bunch of different uh, a bunch of different studies that deal with this issue that highlight these issues. Um, and we'll move forward from there. So thanks for sticking with it in a slightly longer than it ought to have been lecture here, but I wanted to make sure we have uh, maximal time to talk about these issues of sociolinguistics because I think they have ramifications um, outside of the classroom that I want to discuss with you. So we're going to hope, hopefully wrap up sociolinguistics on Wednesday, and then we'll talk about it more in class on Friday. So. Uh, I hope you're having a great day, despite this heavy topic that we're talking about. 
Don't, don't lose sight of the sun. Keep your head up, and I'll talk to you on Wednesday.